Okay. So if you'll recall, we uh, didn't get through the last couple of verses in our last class, which was a week and a half ago now. Um, so we're going to go through the verses that we weren't able to make it through last time, and then um, the text today that we're going to be focusing on is verses <coughs> 13 through 21 of Galatians chapter 5. Since we've missed a couple of classes, uh, Alex and I are going to alter our table of contents a little bit to uh, make up for the text that we uh, have had to that we haven't been able to get to yet to make sure that we are able to get to all of it by the time we come to our last class. So we'll try to have an updated schedule to send out um, for Wednesday's class. <coughs> to start this morning, I want to kind of take a, th I want to take some steps backward. Uh, I want to move back through the text a little bit that we've gone through to get to this point in chapter 5 of Galatians. Uh, and I want to start with looking at Galatians chapter 4, uh, verses 8 through 10. 4, 8 through 10. Formerly, when you did not know God, <coughs> excuse me, you were enslaved to those that by nature, <coughs> I apologize, <coughs> By nature are not gods. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> okay. We'll get through it. I got some. <laughs> it's just not doing much. All right. <coughs> Let me start over in verse 8. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not gods. But now you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God. How can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world whose slaves you want to be once more? You, deserve, you observe days and months and seasons and years. I am afraid that I may have labored over you in vain. <clears throat> so Paul here, we see him talking to the brethren in Galatia. <clears throat> I am really sorry. Um, and explaining to them that they were previously in bondage before they knew God. They were then released from that bondage in Christ. And now that they are free, they're turning back again to these Judaizing teachers, and they're abandoning the freedom that they have in Christ to return once again to bondage, this time enslaved under the law. And the conclusion here that we go through in chapter 4, thank you, in chapter 4 is that the bondage under the law, it's no different than the bondage that they were under in paganism. The result is the same. They're separated from Christ. And then if we move back further into chapter 3, let's look at chapter 3, verses 10 and 11. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. Under the law, they're cursed. It's not possible for them to keep the law, and because of that, it's not possible for them to be justified under the law. And if we look at 3 and verse 14, <clears throat> so that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. So furthermore, by turning to the law, they're rejecting the blessing of Abraham and they're rejecting Christ. And if we move back even further to chapter 2, verses 15 through 21, we ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners, yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. But if, our endeavor, if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law I died to the law, so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. 
I did not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. So Paul has stressed to them that there no <clears throat> that under the law there is no righteousness. Justification can only come through faith in Christ. And now that Paul has presented to them this current condition that they're in and the threat of bondage that's under the law they are, that they are being enticed to, how is it then that Christians who have been freed from the law should conduct themselves? That's the question that he's asking them. And that's what we're going to look at in chapter 5 as we continue on in chapter 5 here. In this next section, Paul is going to answer and explain to them how freedom in Christ is to be understood and how it should be applied in their lives. <clears throat> so, let's go ahead and look at chapter 5, verses 13 through 15. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. So Paul's instructing them here to not use their freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. And the Greek word for opportunity that we see, see here is a word <clears throat> called a forme, which literally means a circumstance from which other action becomes possible. So in other words, he's saying that the freedom that they now have does not give them the license to participate in, flesh, in these fleshly indulgences. Things of the flesh are in opposition to the Spirit. Okay? <clears throat> so, why would they interpret freedom in Christ to mean that they can indulge in desires of the flesh? What do you guys think? Brian? Well, these passages, in my mind, along with other supporting passages, are critical in that they reconcile the grace verses with the works verses. Ephesians 2, chapter 8, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is a gift of God, not a result of works that no one should boast. So we're saved by grace. And what does Paul say? Where sin increases, grace abounds more, which sounds like a license to sin. But what really happens, of course, is that God has given us eternal life, and in that eternal life, he's given us a new life, and we're new creatures. Therefore, we live for Christ now. Therefore, let me put it this way, to sum it all up, we are changed from our former ways where we indulge sin without regret to our present lives where we regret our past sins and we go forward in love and obedience to God, living the life for God because he's given us a new life as his children. Thank you. This, this freedom that they have in Christ, <clears throat> it doesn't give them some sort of diplomatic immunity to where they're free from punishment if they go on continuing in sin. You know, it's possible that they maybe interpreted their freedom as a, some sort of absolute autonomy to do as they please with no repercussions, which is not the case. And that's what Paul's stressing to them here. So if they were to take this newfound freedom as license to sin, what would that then lead to? Yeah, death. They would again be enslaved, right? Looking back at the, the text that we've seen, they would be leaving that freedom to again be enslaved, enslaved under the law, enslaved to sin. Let's take a look real quick at um, Romans 6, 15 through 19. We see something similar here in Paul's letter to the Romans. Romans 6, 15 through 19. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? 
But thanks be to God that you, who were once slaves of sin, have become obedient from the heart through the standard of teaching to which you were committed, and having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you were once presented your, as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. Okay, so do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Paul's saying that it's love for one another that should motivate them to service. Now, think about this. If we have two men, uh, they both attend the same church. One of these men, he wakes up Sunday morning, he gets off from work Wednesday night, and the only thing that motivates him to get over to church services is this feeling of obligation to be seen, or this, this mindset of, oh, if I don't get over there, you know, it, I better go so I don't go to hell, basically, is what, was what it boils down to. But the other person, he wakes up Sunday morning, he gets off work Wednesday evening, and he can't wait to get over to the church building. He's excited to see his brothers and sisters in Christ. He looks forward to the opportunities to provide encouragement, and he wants to worship with the brethren. He doesn't even consider that what he's doing is an obligation because he loves God and he loves his brothers and sisters. So his motivation to be of service and to participate in the fellowship and worship is love. Externally, man one and man two, they might look similar to one another. But what separates them is their hearts, what motivates them. Our freedom to Christ, our freedom in Christ, is to be carried out in our love for one another, in our service toward each other. In verse 14, Paul continues, For the law is fulfilled in one word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Paul here is quoting Leviticus 19. Um, he also does this in Romans chapter 13. And I want to read the Romans passage to you because he provides some commentary along with it. If you would turn over to Romans chapter 13, let's look at verses 8 through 10. Starting in verse 8. Owe no one anything except to love each other, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law for the commandments you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore, love is fulfilling the law. So when Christ lives in us, and, the, and when the love of Christ is made manifest in us, then the whole law is fulfilled without us being under the bondage of the law. So in other words, love leads to the same actions that obedience to the law would require. Does that make sense? Does anybody have any questions or anything to add, Steve? So, take the mission out of that dungeon and, um, you know, they can't do anything. Or, and, and it's really to the contrary. Uh, we have great liberty. There was no one who walked on the earth that had more liberty than Jesus Christ. And what was it that he did? Better than anyone. And is the perfect example for us. That's service. So service and everything that's involved in that is the very act and action that keeps you from selfishness. So the key to not being selfish, the key to not be rooted in that type of evil is to serve one another out of love. When you stop and think about love, okay, then who you think of is the Father and the Son. They define that love. That word there, um, I, I think it's opportunity, is actually a military term, okay? It's your base of operation, okay? I don't know if you've read that in a commentary or not, yeah. but it's a very wonderful description uh, of this, and uh, I think w it is a great example to uh, how it is that you start. Uh, it's a base of operation.
and from that you can uh, not only live a life that benefits so many others, as we've seen this weekend, and, and it's what these trials do, right, uh, and all, but it's also the opportunity to display the love that Jesus Christ uh, has shared with us and expects of us in our daily lives. Yeah, and that's a good way to look at it, because you know, as Paul stresses here, it's, it's not an opportunity to indulge the flesh, but it's an opportunity to imitate Christ in his love and service to one another. Uh, Brian and then John. Yeah, yeah several verses come to mind. Uh, you, you just picked them when I think uh, uh, Romans chapter 1, 6, 1. It's, it shall we continue sin that grace may abound more. And he says, may it never be, of course. Uh, you died to sin, why would you live in it again? And then you go over here in Galatians chapter 3, verse 17. Uh, those who continue in sin would make Christ a minister or servant of sin. In other words, Jesus died in order to protect us from the consequences of sin, not to continue in sin or to sanction sin with impunity, but that we would be changed once again, that we could go forward in, uh, as the children of God, practicing the things of God, the new life. So uh, that's what I see here. And talking about being, you're ch- going on in Romans 6, you know, that we were slaves of sin, now we're slaves to God, we're slaves to Christ, we're slaves to righteousness, servants of righteousness. John. Earlier in this class, you talked about the circumcision of time, Titus versus Timothy. We see in 1 Corinthians 9, Paul becoming all things to all people, and Peter um, playing different roles among different people. On paper, those two things might not look too dissimilar, but what Paul was doing was doing using his freedom for unity, and Peter was using it for division. And as you have the scripture framed, 13 is one side of that dichotomy, and, and 15 is the other. Use it for service to one another, unity. Don't use it to divide, divide the church, divide people, that will consume you. And that's exactly what Peter had done um, in relation to Paul. Yeah, no, that, that's perfect. Um, yeah, and in, in verse 15, but if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. If we're not serving one another, um, then that means that we're concerned about ourselves. We're self-serving instead of being concerned for my brother and sister, which in turn leads to mutual destruction among one another. Okay, any final thoughts or comments through verse 15? negative example, but the contrary position to loving one another and serving one another is uh, really illustrated in a pack of wild animals or coyotes or something like that uh, as they bite and devour one another. I have seen it in the church in my life where instead of love, uh, we we made a meal (laughs) of, uh, uh, of our brethren on some insignificant point. And for that matter, even if it is significant, the idea there is to not to destroy the, the individual. So I think it's important for us to see the negative too, the negative side of this. This is a pack of wild dogs or a pack of wild coyotes. And it's that mentality, Justin, that destroys churches. Okay. Let's continue on then to verses 16 through 18. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. So, what is the relationship that we see here between the Spirit and the desires of the flesh? Well, they're contrast to each other. They don't go hand in hand. They don't have an affiliation together. Yeah, they're opposed to one another, right? If, uh, if someone is walking by the Spirit and allowing the Spirit to lead them, then, they're, um, then they are not fulfilling the desires of the flesh. And if someone is fulfilling the desires of the flesh, 
then that means that they're not allowing the Spirit to lead them. Does that make sense? They, they, they're moving in opposite directions. And as a Christian, we have a decision that we must make. Are we, despite living in the flesh, going to allow ourselves to be led by the Spirit? Or are we going to live... Um, excuse me, let me reread that. Are we going to allow ourselves to be led by the Spirit, and are we going to live by faith in Christ, as Paul states back in chapter 2 and verse 20 of Galatians, or are we going to allow the desires of the flesh to take control of our lives? These two forces, the Spirit and the flesh, are active and they're competing against one another. And if we feed ourselves with the Word of God and allow the Spirit to grow in us, then the Spirit will be active in preventing the desires of the flesh that tempt us. Likewise, if we feed the desires of the flesh and allow them to control us, then those desires will be active in preventing the Spirit from leading us in our walk. If the flesh succeeds, by what standard will we, will we, will we be held to? It's the curse of the law. If we are led by the Spirit, then we're not held to the law, we're held to our faith in Christ and Christ's sacrifice. So in verse 18, if we are led by the Spirit, we are not under the curse of the law. Does that make sense? Any comments on that? Okay. So, what does it mean to be led by the Spirit? Pretty open-ended, Brian. Well, first, uh, Scripture speaks to us as being two men. The, the, the outer man being the flesh and the inner man being the spirit. God speaks to us and influences us intellectually through the word given to us by the Holy Spirit. He speaks to our spirit and he speaks to the mind of our spirit. Satan influences us through the desires of the flesh. And so what God is telling us is that we in the spirit have to be strong enough to bring the flesh into submission to the will of the spirit being the Holy Spirit. So we're being led by the spirit when we receive the word of God and obey it from the heart. And therefore, he says, here, you can't do the things that you want to do, meaning the things that the flesh wants to do. You want to do the things of the spirit. And therefore, you always have this tension. Things that you want to do in the flesh, which are shameful, and the things you know to do in the spirit that rejects those desires. And so that's what, in my mind anyway, we're led by the word, the armor of God that protects us. And the person who does not have the word of God, the armor of God, who is not being led by the spirit, they are going to die because they will therefore be led by the flesh. And the flesh is at war with the spirit and we will die if we let the flesh consume us. I think too, Justin, going back to the previous verses about the freedom piece of it, being led by the Spirit, that's the freedom element of this whole walk, whereas the desires of the flesh, that's the enslavement specifically. So it, I think, yeah, to Brian's point, these things are linked that causes people to change how you think and how you do and what you do specifically if we're led by the Spirit. Yeah. What else? Anybody else? understand regarding to the spirit it's to speak of him and if we don't have the desire to listen if we don't have the desire to pattern our lives in the direction that the holy spirit would provide for us and certainly through the word absolutely through the word but for me it doesn't stop there uh, providence has an awful lot to do with our daily life uh, situations that we have uh, to face we certainly have to face by a study of Scripture, all Scripture being given by inspiration of God and being profitable for all of those things. But the opportunities that come up in our life and the situations that come up, the, division, the dividing of the road, 
uh, where we look back in our lives and we recognize that God Almighty, the Spirit, uh, provided that opportunity for us to do this or that. He didn't make us do it. He provided us that opportunity to grow uh, in character and such as that. So to say that it's just the Word, I think, is to miss uh, something very important in your life. It is the Word, no doubt. Okay, But I think our God provides his children with greater opportunity, and I've preached it because uh, I believe it's true, uh, than just simply reading Scripture. Yeah, yeah. And if we're going to promote Christ, we're going to do that by the way that we live. Uh, if we're being led by the Spirit, then that means that we're walking in love. It means that we're going to serve one another. It means that we're going to give ourselves to the Lord it means that we're going to trust in the Lord to seek God and obey God. And you live your life by God's word. And all of these things result, are a result of loving God as he loves us. Um, I had the opportunity when I was still in college to go to the Philippines for a short time and, uh, with, a, with, a, with a group. And we traveled around to a couple of different islands and I think to maybe... 20 or so different congregations. And we just happened to be there, um, I think it was on the Phil Philippines Independence Day, I think is what it was. And we took that day and we spent most of the day in this central plaza in Manila where they had all these fountains and everything and there was going to be a fireworks show in the evening. And we were just all there with one another and with uh, the brethren that we had been worshiping with. Um, and, you know, we, we weren't like going out and, you know, passing out Bibles or anything like that. But at the end of the day, or towards, towards the end of the day, we had somebody come up to us, and he just asked, you know, who are you? Because um, he had witnessed how we interacted with one another and those around us, and he, he saw something that set us apart. And I think when you're living your life being led by the Spirit, and you live your life with love for one another, that's what's going to promote Christ. That's what sanctifies you. That's what sets you apart. And that, that's, it, it's, it's a way to evangelize. There, you know, evangelism isn't just standing up here and preaching, but evangelism is, is the way that we live our lives and allowing the Spirit to lead our walk. Right, any, any other thoughts or comments, questions through verse 18? Okay. Go ahead and take a look at verses 19 through 21. <clears throat> now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So here, Paul provides some examples of these unmistakable works of the flesh. Uh, and as you go through these, you can begin to categorize them. And I, I think what we see here, or what I've kind of identified, are four categories. And those are sexual immorality, false religion, self-indulgence, and then selfishness and lack of love. So... You may be able to group these slightly differently, differently but to go through this exercise, um, I, I identified three that I think would be grouped under sexual immorality. And looking at the text, feel free to shout them out. What falls under these three? Or what three fall under this category? Some translations vary a little bit in the words that are used through this passage. Mm -hmm. The obvious one. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. So, in the ESV, uh, the, the translation is, or the, the ones that I have identified are sexual immorality, or some translations read fornication, which is basically all kinds of illicit sexual misconduct. Uh, ESV also has impurity, which is just general sexual uncleanliness. Um, 
promoting sexual perversion and illicit excitement, and then sensuality, which is a lack of restraint or shameless misconduct and brazen sexuality. And then identified a couple for false religion. What do you see for that? Idolatry and sorcery, yeah. So idolatry is the worship of false gods, um, sorcery or, or witchcraft, I think it's, it's kind of self-explanatory, but in a sense it was its own religion at that time, and I think a lot of the pagan practices uh, practice this as well. So then the next one, which is the, the largest group, is selfishness and lack of love. So what do we see that could be categorized under selfishness and lack of love? And I think I had eight. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, if, yeah, if you boil it down. <coughs> so we had jealousy. Also had enmity. Which one, Jordan? Rivalries. Mm -hmm. Yep. Disputes. And then I also had envy and strife. <coughs> so we start at the top. Enmity. Enmity is the hatred or ill will, <coughs> or ill will, um, bitterness, and an enemy mindset. So it's having the mindset of being uh, wishing ill will upon another and, and hating one another. Strife is contentiousness and quarreling. Jealousy would be resentment that one does not possess what another has. Fits of anger or wrath, which is explosive temper, detrimental to trust and love. Rivalries, which are warring factions because of selfish ambitions. Dissensions or divisions, um, or actions which would break up a unified body. And divisions or heresies, Referring to a situation after a complete division has occurred, and then envy, which is similar to jealousy. However, jealousy focuses on the self, while envy hates the one who possesses what it is that's desired. So instead of just saying, well, they have something that I don't, and I want that, it's saying, I hate that, that individual because they have what I want, and I don't have it. So it's the difference between the two. And then the last two under self-indulgence, are drunkenness and orgies. Orgies being revelries or events where participants are feeding the desires of the flesh. And Paul is warning them, just as he has warned them in the past, that if anyone partakes of these activities, then they will not inherit the kingdom of God. All right. Any thoughts, David? And I'll kind of open it up after this. We've, we've made it through the last bit of our text, so I think we'll, we've got a little bit of time here. Well, I, I think I heard Jordan say it. Um, when you look at this list, they're all defined by the same thing, and that is lacking in love. Um, I think the last time I was teaching the middle school class, we went into a lot of what we're talking now, and that is what is the motivation for why you obey? And moving from a... Um, motivation of obligation to that of being transformed into the image of Christ, and that is you actually believe in Christ, but you also believe his words. You believe Christ, and that is what he is. You believe that love conquers all. You believe in the power of God, and of, of, of the gospel into salvation, of God into salvation, rather. Um, and in order to believe that, you, all, you then have to prove that any sin is absent in love. And so w I provided them a challenge to go list any sin described in the word of God, and we will discuss how it is lacking in love. And when you start to define anything on those grounds, whether it's adultery, fornication, uh, dissensions, enmity, strife, jealousy, you start to go down and realize all of those are predicated in something other than love, selfishness, or pride. Yeah. Brian. Our works ultimately define who we are. 
Jesus said that those who sin, I wish I had the verse citation, but those who sin are doing the desires of their father, that father being Satan. And those who are slaves of righteousness are doing the desires of God, our father. We have one of two spiritual fathers, whether we like it or not. Either God the father of whom we obey because we love him, or Satan, uh, whom we will obey in rebellion to God because we love those works. And this is a good uh, library, if you will, of all the things that Satan wants us to do in rebellion to God. And, uh, and, and of course, obviously, it's not all-inclusive. You can, uh, the many things that are derived from these particular sins that uh, you could add that fall in the same genre. Anybody else have any comments or thoughts? If not, <clears throat> I think we'll <clears throat> end just a few minutes early then. Um, on Wednesday, we're going to pick up with <clears throat> the rest of this section in chapter 5, which is going to focus on the fruits of righteousness. And something I want to consider here is, you know, we call them the, the works of the flesh and then the fruits of righteousness. I think there's something to that. The works of the flesh is uh, this active uh, labor in things that are opposite of the Spirit, while the fruits of the righteousness, the Word lends itself to, it's not works of righteousness, it's fruits of righteousness. Fruits happen when things are tended, when the soil is tended and the plants are cared for. They, pervert, they produce fruit. So in ourselves, in our own lives, if we are actively tending to our spiritual selves, allowing the Spirit to lead us and feeding the Spirit, then fruits are a byproduct of that, not a direct action that we're responsible for. So something to kind of think about as we uh, get ready for Wednesday's class. So thank you for your time.